Good morning. I'm glad everybody could slide in here with us today. Why don't you stand with us as we begin worship with joy to the world. Yeah. 
Lord, you know our hearts don't deserve your glory. Still, you show the love we cannot afford. Like kids are straining from the way.
Well, I thank you so much for that. Isn't it, isn't it kind of helpful to know that in the world of technology, somehow we, 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 we find a way through. The light of, the light of Christ will still shine. Uh, God will be with us no matter what, even when we don't know how to use lighters, even when the wicks don't work, even when everything in our end of the world doesn't seem to quite work out. Somehow it always does. It's good to see each one of you this morning. This is one of those Sundays where I, you know, I, I really wasn't sure what to expect. Perhaps you weren't either, but I'm glad you're, you're here this morning. Uh, glad you made it with us today. I have a, a few things I want to share with you this morning. Uh, a number of them are in your bulletin in that little packet of material that you might have found on your uh, seat. So I want to go through a few things with you. Uh, first, I want to say a, a word of deep appreciation um, for the, uh, the set that is in place here. Eric Phillips uh, designed the set and, and got it going, um, but um, Mike and Missy and Jeremy were the ones who really uh, did, did the main part, and Emily uh, did the main part of work. I saw them there pretty much all day uh, yesterday. They were working some on Friday and pretty much all day yesterday putting uh, this together. There's a little more that will be done. They can have it ready for the, uh, the uh, children's Christmas program uh, that will be this Wednesday evening, and I hope that you'll come back. This room will be packed with uh, proud parents, and, and it's going to be a wonderful scene. Um, just in case, because some, some people don't quite get it first time around, so I just thought I would share. Would, would you just kind of share what they're looking at here? I'm going to let one of the set builders... And, and, and? Uh, well, this is supposed to be the manger scene. Okay, barn wood kind of thing. But this is the city of Bethlehem on either side. I just didn't want you to think that that was just a picket fence that was about to fall apart there. there uh, the, that, that, that's the, the manger itself. And, of course, you'll see even more of that uh, by this time next Sunday. But thank you so much for, uh, for that. I also wanted to um, share with you the final results of our uh, stewardship campaign, we, we uh, told you I'd come back to you and share, uh, and, and there is some good news here. Um, uh, this full report will be here if you want to look at the details, but I'm, I'm going to give you a few bottom line numbers here. Um, of all the those that turned into pledge, 78 increased their financial giving next year. Of course, we're appreciative of anybody uh, who gives, even if you didn't turn in a pledge, if you are giving and supporting the church, we appreciate it, but it was, it was encouragement to see that 78 uh, are, are increasing their pledge last, uh, over the next year. The, the total increase that we're expecting for 2014 is about $66,000. That's a 15% increase over this year. Uh, it's about $7,000 actually over the draft budget uh, that, was, that was kind of a beginning point for the uh, Finance Committee. Now, the Finance Committee is going to be meeting uh, this Tuesday, taking all these uh, efforts. They're going to put together a final uh, report, uh, recommendation uh, for the uh, budget. That will go to the Administrative Board, which will be this Thursday night. Now, I do want to let you know um, that, that although uh, only the members of the Ad Board have a vote, uh, these board meetings are certainly open to anybody, and any, uh, anybody who comes can have a voice. So if you want to have some input uh, in the budget, then I encourage you to come this Thursday and, 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 and see what's going on um, and be a part of them. Uh, that the ad boards are, are held here uh, each time. But again, I appreciate it. And really, the only thing remaining, uh, we, we've, we've, we've done so well in so many different things uh, this year. The, there's only one uh, thing remaining that will that will top this year off, and that of course is to finish uh, in a financially sound way. This year we're in good shape for 2014. We are a couple of months behind in our apportionments, about $16,000 behind uh, where we where we need to be by year end. Of course, December is always that 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 year when we we get more coming in. Um, Rose tells me no worries. Um, and, and if, you know, all, all I have to say today is that if everybody remains faithful, if all of us do what, what we can and finish our pledges out and so on, we're going to be in great shape. But just keep that in mind because that, that is the, the last uh, kind of big win for this year uh, that, I, that I want for us. And I, I know 
you're going to be able to do that. You'll have an um, insert that was uh, on top of your bulletin, I think, for the Methodist Family Health uh, System. Even, though we're, even as we're talking about our own budgets, our own uh, church needs and so on, I think it's always helpful to remember that, that we also have a chance to support so many ministries and programs beyond our local church. Methodist Family Health is one of those. This is the once-a-year offering uh, that they have a chance to take uh, in, in our conference. They are not supported by our portioned funds, but they, they do a tremendous, tremendous job. When Maggie Beeler was here a few weeks ago, you had a chance to hear a little bit about that. Uh, this is the offering that will, that will support that ministry. So you can take this home. You can, you can send it in yourself if you want to turn something in uh, and get some credit through the church that way. Uh, just do that and, and clearly mark that it's for Methodist Family Health, and we'll be sure to, to credit it that way. Uh, either way, uh, that they will get that information. And then um, another thing I want to share is the second spot poll that I'm giving you since, uh, since coming here. That, that means that today is it. If, if you don't fill it out today before you leave, uh, you don't get a second chance on this. But this is going to help me uh, primarily as I prepare sermons and start thinking about the coming year. Uh, I would love to have your input uh, and, and individually, uh, not just a family, but your individual input on uh, either books of the Bible that you would like me to focus on or that you, you, you would like to hear. Any book uh, is fair game. They're all God's word. They all have something to say to us. So if, if there's a book of the Bible that you want, please, please let me know and, and, and rank them first, second, or third. Um, and then, and then you see if there are words that you want to find, questions you want answered, issues you want uh, discussed. Uh, for, for some, this will be the best place to do that, and that will help me. Uh, it will also help the staff as we prepare for the coming year. So afterwards, uh, be sure you fill this out. If you, if you have a pen, you can take some time while I'm preaching if you, if you need to do that. And, and, and if you lose interest, just, just write your notes down. But afterwards, uh, put them on the pew on either side. Just put them on, on the pew on either side and you way out. And I, I will appreciate that greatly. Again, remember the, the Christmas program uh, this Wednesday. Uh, and also remember the, uh, s the special program we're going to have next week. We will have uh, a, a new song service next week. That would be, this next Sunday would be a wonderful Sunday to spend the entire morning here because the services will be so different. Uh, we'll, we'll have our service here stay for Sunday school, and then I invite you to stay uh, for the lessons and carol service that the choir will be bringing at the 11 o'clock service. All that will be going on. Then we're coming back uh, for those who want to carol, 4 o'clock next Sunday. For those who just want to eat and, and uh, have fun and party, that will be at 6 o'clock next Sunday. I'll give you some more instructions. Are there any other announcements, anything I missed this morning? I'd like to invite someone to come forward as we present then to God his tithes and our offerings this day. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to give a portion of our gifts back to you. We trust, we, we know, and we give thanks for the fact that you will bless them and use them for further the work of your kingdom on earth, even through your church. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen.
y'all like gifts? You do? You like to get gifts? Yeah. You like to give gifts? It's better to give, isn't it? Come up here, Carson. Have you got something to say? You were right. You like to give them and receive them. I do, too. Well, to it is. Come up here and say this on the mic. That sounded so good to me. It's better to give then receive. Sure is, Mac. Sure is. Okay, well, we're going to talk today about the gifts that we give to God and that he gives to us. And we are going to read our scripture from our little Bible from Luke. And Annabeth, I'm going to call you to come up and read our scripture from Luke today. God sent an angel named Gabriel to send to Mary. Congratulations, Mary. You are going to have a baby boy named Jesus. He shall be very great. Yes, he is great. Thank you, Annabeth. And we did get a gift from Jesus, didn't we? Baby Jesus. So we got him from God. What can we give back? Can we give God a gift? Come up here, Carson, so everybody can hear you. What can we give to God? Love. Love. I like that. That's good. Yes. We all can give our gifts to God. You've got something? Trust. Fresh? <laughs> That's good. Thank you, darling. Okay, anybody else got anything? Okay. Um, love. Love. Okay, we can give all of our gifts to God, can't we? And you can think of many. But first of all, I'm run wondering what's in this box. It rattles. You think it's a toy? You think it is? What do you think? Well, let's just see. Come up here, Carson. You can see and tell us. Okay. What is it? A mirror. Okay, get it out and show it to everybody. It's a mirror, and when you look in the mirror, who do you see? Yourself. You see yourself. So that's what we can give to God. We can give ourselves. And when you leave y'all a mirror to take home so during the week you can think what can I give back to God I can give myself I can give my love I can give things that are in my heart so we don't want to forget what all we have you named a few that we can give back to God so look in the mirror and think about it this week okay how many of y'all remember our five finger prayer anybody know it Carson you're so smart. You remember the five-finger prayer? Okay, do you remember what that one is? No. Friends? That's good. Yeah, Max. Okay. It is for the ones closest to our heart because our thumb is the closest one to our heart. So we think of those that we love the most, like mother, daddy, grandma, grandpa, family, all our friends, so that's the thumb. Okay, what is the pointer? This one's one you never want to forget. Emily, you remember? Oh, oh, okay, what is it? What? Yeah, that's one, that's one. The pointer is the ones that we look to that point us in the right direction. Remember we said Coach JR and our teachers and our preacher, and all of those that point us in the right direction. Okay, the tallest one. Which one is that? Okay. Jesus. That is a good one. Good answer. The tallest one is the very important people around that lead us in the right direction, like the president, the governor, the mayor, all those important people. Okay, the next one. 
is the ring finger, and that's our weakest finger. And who could that be? Okay. It can be people that are sick in the nursing home, hospital, didn't get to come to church today. They're the weak people. So that's who we're praying for when we look at that finger. Okay, little pinky, who is that? It's ourselves because we pray for us last, don't we? So when you're in school or wherever you are and you can't pray out loud, you just look at your five fingers and you've got a prayer for each one. So don't forget that. So let's say amen together. You ready? Here we go. Amen. And then come up here and get your mirror. Need a little help here. You want to help me? Okay. We're not going to say what color. We're just going to get one. No, we can't choose colors. I'm closing my eyes and just give it to you. Why don't you pass them out, the rest of them? Okay? Thank you, and y'all come back again. Bye-bye. And just remember, one of the other uh, side lessons from that is if you ever forget what you're supposed to pray for, just pray to Jesus. That, that'll, 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 that always works. That's always a good answer. Patty might disagree with me on this because I haven't always proven it at home. But I actually like Christmas. I like this season. I'm like most, maybe most people, but certainly I think probably most guys, I grumble a little bit, uh, especially when it comes to decorating and putting out Christmas things. I, I grumble, and I don't even ask and just accept the fact that I, I do that. But once it's done, I enjoy it. Once, once the lights are out or whatever decorations or in a new house like we had this year, we figured out what we're going to do and where we're going to put things, then I'm happy again. And, and, and so I get through the season, I enjoy the lights, I enjoy the decorations, I enjoy the, the, the Christmas services, I enjoy the different kind of things, the scenery, the, the Christmas tree, the Advent wreath, I enjoy the, the songs we get to sing, uh, all, those, all those different things. And, and like the kids, I enjoy the gifts, both giving and receiving, I enjoy all that stuff, all those little extras, but I, I, I suppose... That, that of all, all the extras, I, I, I really do like the Christmas cards about as much as any. Um, I, I don't know if you're like me, but, but when, I, when I get a card, if I'm the one, well, even if I'm not the one to open it, but the first thing I do is I open it to the inside, and I, I want to see who it's from. That's for me, the first thing I do, I want to see who it's from, and, and then I'll read the, the inscription, whatever they wrote. It might be Merry Christmas, or there might be a whole letter inside, but I'll read that, and only then will I go back and I, and I fold the card up and I look at the front cover to see, to see what it is. Now, over the years, and, and, and I'm sure this is true with you as well, I've, I've, noticed, I've noticed something interesting about these Christmas cards. They may be very different, and, and yet they're very similar in a way. One card might, that, that, that either, either you or I send or we receive, one card might have nothing but a word. It might say joy or peace or love. Another card might have nothing but maybe a little baby Jesus with, with soft edges kind of fading out. And, and little baby Jesus is always smiling and, and, uh, or sleeping peacefully and always in a, in a bed of nice, soft, clean hay. Sometimes the card might have that same baby Jesus surrounded by, by, by a whole entourage of people looking on. Sometimes it's Mary and Joseph. Sometimes it's a whole lot of others. You, you've seen some pictures, I'm sure, of three wise men traveling eastward, in a beautiful starlit sky. Maybe you've seen cards of, of, of maybe three angels trumpeting their, their notes of joy in that same starlit night. You've seen pictures of, 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 of carolers. Maybe, you, maybe you've sent out some Christmas cards of, of, uh, of a church, beautifully lit. And, and, of course, they're always decked out with, with a perfect blanket of snow. Never looks like an Arkansas winter. You, know, you never see an ice storm, nothing like that. It's always this perfect blanket of snow, not even a footprint out anywhere. 
point is, all those Christmas cards, that they, they, they have so many different pictures, and yet I've noticed that they have one thing in common. Every card I have ever seen always depicts a scene of peace. The world is good. Everything's well. Things are as they are supposed to be. There's love and laughter and warmth and peace and joy that just seems to fill the air. You can see it on the faces of, of any of the people, even of the animals that are in these. They always depict peace. The only problem with that is that for most of us, that doesn't fit our world. For most of us, Truthfully, maybe all of us. Our world is rarely that peaceful. Things don't fit together that nicely. Our world is filled with a lot more pain and hurt and stress and sorrow and confusion than any Christmas card I've ever seen. The truth of it is, in our world, all those things, the pain, the sorrow, the hurt, the confusion, all those kinds of things, they don't take a break, not even for a holiday, not even for Christmas. So as much as I like those cards, as much as I like the the beautiful church decorated and set up, there's something about it when I go back to my everyday life, that just seems to jar. It just seems to collide sometimes. I know that at this time of year, we're supposed to put on our happy faces. I know that we're supposed to go out and say Merry Christmas to to, to the people around us, but I also know, because I've seen it for so many years, that inside... Not everybody, but a lot of people. Christmas isn't that merry at all. We struggle. For some, it's just the season itself. It's just too busy. For some, it costs too much. For others, it's the stress of having so many things to do, all those lights, all those decorations, all the parties we have to go to. For for some, it's just not having the time or the energy to take care of it all. But for some, it goes deeper. You don't have to look very hard if you're willing to find people who are incredibly lonely in the holidays, especially the Christmas season. You don't have to look hard to find people who are grieving and trying to cope with with maybe the first Christmas they've had to live by themselves because someone they love died that year. You don't have to look very far to find people, if you're willing, who are going to be wondering if they'll even get one Christmas card this year, if anybody cares about them. You don't have to look all that hard to find people who are struggling financially this season. You really don't have to look that hard to find people for whom the stress and the pain goes deep, deep, deep inside of us. If that's one of you, if that is perchance one of you, and I'll guarantee it will be somebody this morning, then this sermon is just for you. The rest of you can listen. But this is for the one of you who's feeling pain, who's struggling, who's wondering about God or where God is this day. And if that's one of you here this morning at this new song service, what I want you to know is you're not alone. Even the first Christmas had more than its share of pain and suffering and sorrow and heartache. And in fact, all of that's built into the very fabric the Christmas story itself. Now, I'm not going to read 
the really familiar parts of the story, the, the, the parts we, we hear so often. You, you can picture this. You know this. It's kind of the scene that we've got depicted here. You know about Mary's unplanned, unplanned pregnancy. You know about how Joseph desired to divorce her. You know about the, the, the pain that, that was going on. You, you, can, you can imagine how, how they had to endure rumors and, and, and finger pointing and whispers behind their back as Mary began to show the pregnancy. You can, you can imagine how, how difficult all that was for them. And you, you know how it only compounded at, at a time when they should have been so satisfied and, and so excited about everything. They suddenly heard about a census they weren't prepared for. And now they're going to have to pay a tax with money they might not have had. Worse, they're going to have to take a long trip that they had not prepared for. At the very moment, Mary was due. You think you've got problems. I don't think so. You know how the story goes. They, they finally made it to Bethlehem. They, they, they got there at a, at a point in time, whether it was too late or just, just because there were too many in the crowd. But there were, there were no decent places for, the, for this family to stay. You know how they had to stay in the only place they could find that would offer even a little bit of shelter, just a, a cattle shed. And I guarantee that that shed or that cave was not like any of the Christmas cards. It, it very likely was kind of drafty like, like that one would have been. It was almost certainly filled with dirty hay and, and impolite animals. And that night when she was due, very likely there was no doctor around, no nurse, certainly no epidurals to help with the pain. There was none of that. It's the last thing you want on a Christmas card. There was plenty of pain. Plenty of struggle, plenty of confusion to go around. Now, we know that there was also joy. In the midst of everything, there was, there was plenty of joy, plenty to celebrate, plenty of peace. The angels did sing. The shepherds did wonder. And the wise men did worship. And the baby was born. There was plenty of joy. But those things passed as quickly as they pass in everyday life. All too quickly, the angels faded away. Shepherds had returned back to the fields. The wise men had to go home by a longer and more difficult route. And life quickly returned to normal. But not really. In fact, for the Holy Family, instead of things getting better, they got worse. The Bible, the Christmas story, the part that we don't like reading all the time, says it got a lot worse. And that's where I want to pick up the story today. It's in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. Matthew writes this, When the wise men had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. So it was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. Can you imagine? I mean, that, that's hard for me to even imagine something like that. At a time when most new parents, their, their greatest worry and stress would be how to childproof their home. Mary and Joseph have to flee their home. They have to get up and leave with maybe minutes, maybe just hours of notice, have to flee in the middle of the night for fear of their very lives. I mean, there's nothing peaceful about this. Can you, can you imagine how stressful this would have been? I mean, can you imagine the questions that Mary and Joseph must have had? Why? God, why now? Why us? God, can't you do something about this? What is going on here? Why is this happening to me? God, where are you? Which is a question a lot of people ask this time of year. 
Sometimes the truth is God seems so far away. Now, unless you think that Mary and Joseph were the only ones struggling, the Christmas story tells us very clearly that they were not alone. There was a lot of other pain going around. Let me pick the story up. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. And friends, I don't know how many young boys that was, whether it was two or, or, or 22. I don't even want to imagine the pain, the shock, the anguish that fell upon households, that fell upon parents and siblings as, as Roman soldiers descended upon that town of Bethlehem, descended and, and, and wreaked their havoc. As they barged in different doors and went about their, their errands of evil, I'll never see a card, I'll never send a card that shows that scene, that can convey the anguish, the cries. What I don't get is that that's such a part of the Christmas story, a scene that seems to have absolutely nothing to do with the angel's pronouncement of good tidings, of a great joy. For all the people, peace on earth, goodwill to all men. How can those two scenes be part of the same story? I don't understand a lot of that. I don't understand why those things had to happen. That's a story that gives rise to me to so many questions. God, why would, why would you let that happen? Why does that kind of pain, that, 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 that story of death, have to be part of a Christmas story? God, couldn't you, have, couldn't you have just gotten rid of Herod before he had a chance to wreak his evil on the world like that? For that matter, God, couldn't you, you who gave a, 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 an angel's pronouncement to Mary and Joseph and warned them, couldn't you have sent the same angel to the other families whose boys were about to be killed? Couldn't you, God? Couldn't you have done something? Why didn't you? And I don't know. I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer to those kind of questions any more than I know the answer to why, why God allows pain in your life. One of the most frustrating things for a pastor is to have to say, I don't know. Because so often it comes when someone comes up and says, Jim, why did God take my husband, or my wife, or my child, or my brother or sister this year? I don't know. God, how am I, Jim, or Jim, how am I supposed to make it? I don't, I don't have the money. I, I, I want to do, do what's right for the kids, but I, I, don't, I don't have what, it, what it's going to take. I don't know. Why do I have to go through one more Christmas in pain and loneliness? I don't know. Why, why Jim, why didn't God take me? Why didn't God take me now instead of leaving me here in this, in this pain and suffering in this body that's not working? I don't know. Why do I hurt so much? I don't know. In moments like that, I'm, 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 I'm driven back to this one thing. This one thing, though, that I do know. This one thing that the Christmas story tells me over and over and over and over again, that in this world of pain, in this world of sorrow, in this world where hurt and, and, and deceit is real, where evil is real, where, where, where life doesn't always seem fair or just, in this very world, 
just like ours, God came. And he didn't just hover above us, looking over the world. No, he came into the world. He came and became one of us. He left the glory and the splendor of heaven, and he, and, he, and he came and he immersed himself. He came as a baby. He came in the very muck and the mire of the world itself. He came in the midst of the pain. He came in the midst of a sorrow. He came in the midst of a story that would have death and that would have injustice. And he came. And that's the world in which he grew. As he became human like us. Until the day that he'd take that pain and that sorrow and that hurt and even that death upon himself for our sake. He came and he bore it all. This baby, this man, this savior so that we could have hope so that we could have something more. He didn't come to take all our pain away from us. He didn't come to make this world a perfect place, not now, not in our lifetime. He didn't come to set all the injustices right, to, to, to banish all evil, not now, not in our lifetime. But he came to give us hope came to give us a way out, and that too is part of this story. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are now dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went back to the land of Israel. It's built into the very story that somehow God provides a way. And you might, if you heard steep, you might say, yeah, well, that's fine for Mary and Joseph. What about those mothers and fathers who lost children, whose children died? They didn't come back. No, they didn't. Any more than your loved ones who die will come back. That's a world in which we live. But I dare say that even for them, there was a chance for hope. Even for them, God came. And God gives us what we need. Even if at times all it is is enough strength just to endure the moment. But God is with us. God does love us. And God will be with us in the midst of the pain. I love what the psalmist said long ago in Psalm 34. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord will deliver him from them all. Perhaps the way that happens is through hope. Friends, one of the saddest things that I've ever, that I've ever seen is a person who has no hope. He's lost that hope. Someone who just can't bring themselves to believe that life will get better. Someone who can't bring themselves to believe that, that, that they'll ever be loved by someone. Someone who can't believe that their sins will be forgiven. Someone who can't believe that they'll be set free from their past. Someone who can't believe that their future can be better than their past. People without hope. They die a thousand times inside when they don't, even have to, they don't even have to do it once because God is here, the God who loves us, the God who knows the world we live in, who experienced and absorbed the pain we live in. He says, I'll give you strength. I'll give you hope. I'll give you a future. Friends, right now, this, this morning, this early morning, 
If there's someone here this morning and you're hurting, and deep inside you don't feel like laughing or celebrating, find your peace. Find your hope. And I invite you to just come to Christ. Your pain won't go away automatically. The hurts won't disappear. But you can know that God is with you. And you can find strength in that. We're going to sing a final song. I'm going to let the the, the band come on up. We're going to sing a final song. And if, you know, I specifically asked for a, a cross and a kneeling rail to be out today. Just to remind us that the story isn't just about a manger in Bethlehem. It's about a cross. It's about a Savior. It's about hope. And if you need to spend a little time in prayer, I invite you to do that as we stand for our final hymn. I'll be up here afterwards. If you, if you want to talk, we'll go over there and talk. Don't leave without having that kind of peace in your heart. Let's stand. Another silent night Above your deep dream of sleep A giant star lights up the sky
skin Deep as slumbering where we lay America, where we go down in history As a nation with no room for his king Will we be sleeping? Will we be sleeping? United States of America Looks like another silent night world goes on, the sun comes up, goes down, the world orbits round and round, day blends into day, but God is here, right now, right here, and God loves you. In the midst of the pain, in the midst of the hurt, confusion, questions, whatever it might be, God is here now. So this season, turn to him, find your peace, and walk with hope, and let God heal you. Go in peace, deep inside peace, and go with hope. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen.